I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going to him who sent me. And none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I've said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they did not believe in me. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will speak not on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Would you pray with me? God in heaven, we thank you for your word. Would you send your Holy Spirit now and implant that word in us? Guide us to your truth that we might see the glory of Jesus Christ and glorify you this morning. Speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, we are continuing a series that has been going through the Gospel of John. And in this series, we have been in what is called the Upper Room discourse, and that is the upper room that Jesus took his disciples to after his triumphal entry the night before he was betrayed and given over to Caesar. And so here in the upper room, he's already washed his disciples' feet. They've shared the Passover meal, and he's now going through a series of teachings and prayers, which are his last teaching and his last prayers with his disciples on earth. And what we come to today is we come to a teaching of Jesus that focuses on the Holy Spirit. And in this focus, we're going to see that Jesus teaches us about two different truths, two different types of truths about the Holy Spirit. And those are our two main sections today. And we'll see that we'll learn about the nature of the Holy Spirit. And then second, we'll learn about the work of the Holy Spirit. So you might think of those as the two major categories that we're looking at today, the nature of the Holy Spirit and the work of the Holy Spirit. And if you were here a few weeks ago, you heard Pastor Nate preach a sermon that was also about the Holy Spirit. And he asked the question, who is the Holy Spirit? And from that passage, we saw several different truths about who the Holy Spirit is. And that's more aligned with our first point today, speaking of the nature of the Holy Spirit. Who is the Holy Spirit? But here in this last teaching in in John 16 on the Holy Spirit, we also see more specifically about the work that he does. And what we'll see is that both the Spirit's nature and his work is the nature and work of Jesus Christ. So the Holy Spirit shares much in common with the Lord Jesus Christ, and his work is the same work. It's the work of the gospel, the work of Jesus Christ on earth. So let's first, let's talk about the nature of the Holy Spirit. And from this passage, we learn at least three aspects of that nature. And for the note note takers among you, and I see a few, these three, I'll try to go slow enough so you can write them down. The Holy Spirit comes from Jesus. The Holy Spirit comes from Jesus. The second is the Holy Spirit is sent when Jesus goes away. So the Holy Spirit comes from Jesus. The Holy Spirit is sent when Jesus goes away. And third, the Holy Spirit is a consolation to believers. So he comes from Jesus. He's sent when Jesus goes away, and he is a consolation to believers. And at one level, I think all three of these points 
can be can seem fairly obvious from the passage. So thinking of the first one, the Holy Spirit comes from Jesus. We've already heard that several times in these teachings. Jesus had said several times that he is the one who's going to send the Holy Spirit. And here we see it in verse 7, where Jesus says, I will send him to you. And when we stop and think about what are the implications of Jesus sending the Holy Spirit, We have to take a broad view, and we'll consider a lot of who he is and what he does, but it's incredible implications. So think about this. Think about who the Holy Spirit is. We learn from this passage that he's the spirit of truth. And then we see from this passage, like we'll we'll talk about later, that his works on earth are supernatural and divine. Just in our passage alone, the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts the world with regards to sin, righteousness, and judgment. And then in verse 13, the Holy Spirit is the one who who will declare the things that are to come. In other passages of Scripture, we learn that the Holy Spirit is God's mediation or mediator for divine revelation. He's the one through whom God speaks. He's the one who dwells with us. He is God's, he's the one who allows God's temple and mediates God's temple to dwell through us. He's the one who gives new life to those who are dead in their trespasses. The Holy Spirit is the one who sanctifies believers. He allows us, he brings us into worship, and he does a host of all these other supernatural works. And if he's doing that supernatural work, and Jesus is the one who sent him, the implication is that Jesus is divine. Jesus is the one who is sending a divine mediator, not mediator, divine agent And it's amazing that Jesus is claiming essentially divinity here, but he's also claiming divinity for the Spirit. Jesus is claiming a supernatural power and control for both him and the Holy Spirit because he's saying who who the Holy Spirit is and the works that he does are works that only God can accomplish. The Holy Spirit comes from Jesus because just as Jesus is God, The Holy Spirit is also God. Now, if you're new here this morning, or maybe you're new to the Christian faith, or maybe you're new to thinking deeply about the Christian faith, this concept can be confusing. The last comment that Jesus is God and the Holy Spirit is God can be confusing. How can Jesus be God, the Holy Spirit be God, and God the Father be God, and there still only be one God? What we call this mystery, we call it the Trinity, and it's one of the foundational truths of Christian belief. It is a truth whose beauty is so complex and so deep that whether you're brand new to the Christian faith or you have been a Christian for a lifetime, there are still depths of that beauty that you do not understand. And while it might be confusing, there are some helps or suggestions going forward that can help guide us in the truth and and maybe even lift some of the confusion. And so what we, what we can do is we can look to the Bible and we can see, well, what does the Bible say about God and about his Holy Spirit and what can we learn about them? Well, here in our passage, we see a few things. And one is that the Spirit is different than Jesus, right? We've already seen that Jesus is going away and Jesus is sending the Spirit. So Jesus, he's going away. And as we'll confess later today in our liturgy, we'll confess that Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is seated bodily in heaven at the right hand of the Father. And so he has gone away. He has left. And yet his spirit is here because he sent him. And so there's a difference there. And yet the spirit is the same in the sense that he is always carrying out the same work of Jesus Christ. And so we see that tension between sameness and difference between the spirit and the son. Both are God. And while it doesn't help solve the mystery of the Trinity, it is something that can be an encouragement to us as we learn about our God who is in heaven and who is also here with us present in his Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is sent by Jesus. He's a divine agent of his work. He comes from Jesus and he is divine as Jesus is. And Jesus says, he comes, he sends him. Jesus says he sends the Spirit because he's going away. Notice in verse 5, Jesus says, I am going to him who sent me. Jesus is returning to his Father. 
And he's told disciples this before. He's told us several times. In fact, this very night in the teaching in the upper room discord, he's mentioned, I am going away. I'm going to the Father. Jesus knows that his hour has come and he's preparing his disciples for his departure. And as I've mentioned, in Jesus' absence, it is the Spirit who continues the work that he was doing. The Holy Spirit continues the work of the gospel. When Jesus leaves, the Spirit becomes the agent of that work. Now, one quick note on the wording of verse 5. In verse 5, you see Jesus says, None of you ask me, where are you going? And for our particularly astute readers, or maybe those with good memories, you may think to yourself, wait a second, I think I've heard that question before. And in fact, there are two times earlier in this section even that disciples have asked similar questions. So going back to chapter 13, Thomas asked a question about, we don't know where you're going, Lord. But then in chapter 14, or excuse me, it is in 13, where Peter The disciple Peter uses these exact words to say, where are you going? And so what we come to is we come to something that some people would call a contradiction in the Bible. But I think it's important for us when we meet things that we don't understand in the Bible. So here we have Jesus saying, none of you ask me, where are you going? And yet before we have a disciple saying, where are you going? One of the things that that can do to us is it can make us slow down and look to what is the Bible teaching. And and when we do, when we slow down, we remember that the Bible is a very old book. It was written over 2,000 years ago. It was written in different languages than we currently speak, and it's written from a different cultural perspective than we share. And we remember those things. It's helpful for us to know that the Bible may not always speak in the same ways that we tend to speak. And so what is going on here? What, why does Jesus say, none of you ask me where I'm going? Well, there are several possible solutions to, to solve, quote unquote, solve this contradiction. Uh, but I think the one I'm most persuaded by, we don't need to get into all of them here. It's not helpful always to list out, you know, like, well, here are the nine different ways that people solve this. But the one I'm most persuaded by uh, is you can think of what is the purpose behind the questions? What is the literary context and the purpose behind people asking these questions? And there's one author, D.A. Carson, who uses a helpful example here. And he uses the example of a father and a son. You might imagine a father with his young son, and they've planned to go on a fishing trip. And at the last minute, the father has to be called away to an emergency meeting. And he goes to his young boy, and he says, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't go fishing with you today. I've got this emergency I've got to go take care of. And the boy might respond with saying, well, where are you going? And it's not that the boy actually is concerned with the destination of the father. No, what's happened is the question is a protest, and what the boy is really asking is, why are you leaving me? Why do you have to go? And so I think what's happening here is out of the grief of The disciples, they have been focusing on their loss and their sense of not knowing why Jesus has to go. And he is trying to direct them to his destination and the purpose of why he's leaving. In a sense, he is trying to console them in their grief. And so that is the third truth of the nature of the Holy Spirit, is that the Holy Spirit is a consolation to believers. Notice in verse 6, Jesus says, sorrow has filled your heart. The disciples are grieved that Jesus is going away. And so Jesus comforts them with a promise of sending his Holy Spirit. You can hear the compassion when I reread the words in verse 7. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go away, I will send him to you. You can almost hear the same tone that a loving father would use to his son. I'm sorry I have to go away, but I want you to know it's for the best and it's for your good. The Holy Spirit is a consolation to a weary, confused, and grieved follower of Jesus Christ. And when we think about that, it's helpful for us to take a moment now and apply that. Apply that truth directly to our lives. Because all of us will face loss and sorrow and grief. 
And I've said before from, from up here that this year in particular for many has been a year of sorrow and conflict and grief. And if it's not this year, just live, live life. And every year you will come upon sorrow, upon loss, upon pain, upon conflict and sadness and loneliness. And just as Jesus knows the disciples' sorrow, he knows your sorrow. He knows the abuse or mockery or shame or guilt or any other sorrow that you have encountered in your life. And because he knows those things, he has compassionately sent his Holy Spirit, his helper, his comforter to you. And that is why he had to go, so that he could send his spirit. He has not left us alone. He has not abandoned us as orphans, but the work, in the work of the Holy Spirit, he consoles us, his children. So how? How does he console us? Well, I think the answer to that question is found in the specifics of the work of the Holy Spirit. And that's our second main point for today, the work of the Holy Spirit. And he, he consoles us through the work of the Holy Spirit because the work of the Holy Spirit is gospel work. It is the work of Jesus Christ. And so three points in three different ways that the Holy Spirit works in this passage. And first is that the Holy Spirit convicts the world. Second is that the Holy Spirit guides us in truth. And finally, the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus. And we'll see that this pattern, convicting the world, guiding us in truth, and glorifying Jesus is, like I said, the pattern of the gospel. So first, the first work of the Holy Spirit, he convicts the world. Now, Nate mentioned a helpful definition last week, if you were here with us, about what it is, what does the world mean here? What does it mean that he convicts the world? Well, first you have to know what the world is. And the world in the Gospel of John represents the systems and the structures of human culture and nature that are in opposition to God and his kingdom. So the world are any systems or structures in human culture or nature that are in opposition to the work of God as kingdom. Or in general terms, anything that would resist or, or be opposed to God, that is the world. That is what the Holy Spirit comes to convict. And as we consider what does that mean for us, I think it means two things. Is that one is that the world is something that is external that it convicts, but it's not just that. I think too often we can think uh, too sharply in terms of divided that the world is something out there. It's something out there that is against me and against God and against his purposes. And the Bible consistently teaches us that the world is also in here. And so the Holy Spirit has come to convict the world, both the outside world fighting against God, but also any vestige of me that would oppose God, that would hide in my heart and be opposed to his work. When we look more carefully at this work and we see how does the Holy Spirit convict the world, John is explicit here in verses 8 through 11. Starting in verse 8, John says, The Holy Spirit will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will no longer see me. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. And notice how much do these things sound like the work of Jesus Christ? Sin, righteousness, and judgment. It is the work of Jesus Christ. All three are integral to the work of the gospel. So we, concerning sin, concerning sin and because they do not believe in me. Jesus came to take away the sins of the world. And in the Gospel of John, we've learned that the chief sin among all sins is not believing in him. So the Spirit convicts the world because of sin, because the world does not believe in Jesus. But the Spirit also convicts the world concerning righteousness. And again, this is the work of the gospel. All the work that Jesus did was done according to his righteousness. And he says that the Spirit will continue to work because he is the one who has to leave. He's going to his Father. So the Spirit is the one that's going to continue his work in righteousness. And then, of course, Jesus is the judge. 
He has already said so several times in John. He said it three times in chapter 5, once in chapter 8, and probably most clearly in chapter 9, where he says, for judgment, I came into this world. And as Jesus prepares to go, he knows that that work is coming to completion because the ruler of the world will be judged at Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. So we see that the Spirit's work in convicting the world is the work of Jesus Christ. It is the work of the gospel. And as it is the work of the good news, we praise God that it doesn't end at sin and judgment. Otherwise, we would all be left outside the kingdom, dead in our trespasses and sin. But look at what Jesus teaches us, that that the Spirit's work also includes guiding us in truth. In verse 13, Jesus says, When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. And it is the Holy Spirit who ministers to us in Jesus' absence. Now today, our Lord is reigning at the right hand of the Father, as I've mentioned. And yet, we still have communion with him because his Spirit is here to guide us and preserve us in truth. As one author put it, the Spirit gives us what we need for our present continuing walk with God. And I wish we had more time to reflect here, but as we think about how the Lord preserves us and how he guides us, one helpful way to think about it might be to contrast the guidance of the Spirit with other worldly guidance that would compete for our attention and for our belief in truth. And so there are a bunch of other different voices that are calling out that would want to be our guide. You might think of of a voice within your own head, whether it's the voice of your past or a voice of pride or a priority to wanting to place yourself above others. That might be a voice that's trying to direct you to a false version of truth. Or it could be the voice of our culture, our culture that would try to shape you after its own image. It would try to get you to believe in what is right and true according to its terms and not true according to God's terms. Or it could be the voice of even our educational, modern educational system that would tell us that through hard work and diligence and a rigorous application of science that we can come to truth. Or it's the voice of secularism and relativism that would tell you that really the the thing to do is just to find your own truth. All of these would be false guides. All of these would lead us astray. All of these are also probably a temptation for us at some point. And so the Lord has sent his spirit that he might be our true guide, guiding us in his truth. In his kindness and mercy, God sent his spirit to expose those false truths of our world and guide us ultimately to the Lord Jesus Christ. Because as the Spirit guides us, he guides us to the last work of his Holy Spirit, which is that he glorifies Jesus. If you look in verses 13 and 14, we see that the Holy Spirit declares to us the things that are and things that will be, and in doing so, he glorifies Jesus. Now here again, we see that the work of the Holy Spirit is the work of the gospel. Notice notice the movement from the beginning to end of these things. From sin to righteousness to judgment to guidance or preservation to glory. This is the good news of Jesus Christ, that sinners who were dead in their trespasses and sins can glorify God the Lord, and have peace with him through the work of Jesus and through his Holy Spirit. It's the same work. The Holy Spirit's work is the same work as Jesus because the Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. And Christ is in him, and he is in Christ, and they are both in the Father. This is the work that God planned before the foundations of our very world. It is the work that the gospel writer John invites us to because it's the work that Jesus invites invites us to together with his Holy Spirit. Jesus has come as a light of the world to a grieving world. And he has come that those who grieve might have life and have it in abundance. And because he knew 
he would have to return to his father. He sent his Holy Spirit to continue that work on earth. This is the work that the Holy Spirit carries out even now, even today, even in us. And because he continues this work, because this work is ongoing, we're going to end our time a little differently this morning. Because it was about 34, 35 years ago that the Holy Spirit worked in my life in a new and incredible way. Uh, If you know my family, I was about the age of our youngest daughter, Charlotte, and it was a setting much like this, a Sunday morning where I was with my parents. So kids, I was in your shoes. I was sitting next to my parents, listening to a guy, maybe he wasn't up on stage, but a guy talking about Jesus. And what he did is he told a story of a man who knew that there was something wrong And he didn't know what it was, but he knew that he couldn't fix it. And that story we call sin. He knew that he was sinful and that only God was the answer. And the only way to get to God was through Jesus Christ and the work of his Holy Spirit. And so this pastor prayed, and he invited me to pray along with him. And as I prayed along with the pastor, the Holy Spirit changed my heart. and He made me a new creation that very morning. And so we're going to pray a similar prayer this morning. And young people, I invite you to actually say the words in your head, in your heart, along with me. And if you're not young people, I invite you to say the words in your heart to pray along with me. Because the work of the Holy Spirit, there is a one-time aspect in it where he changes hearts for eternity. And then it continues. And he continually changes us and renews us after his own image. So this is a prayer for those who do not know the Lord, and this is a prayer for those who do and want the Holy Spirit to work. So again, I invite you silently in your head to pray along with me. Would you pray? Heavenly Father, you are God in heaven. You are the one who made all things, even the very rain that we hear falling outside our door. In your mercy, Lord, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, that all who would believe in him would have life in his name. And in your love, Father, you sent your Holy Spirit to convict the world, to guide your children, and to glorify your Son, Jesus. We pray that this work would continue even here this morning at Christ Church Bellingham. Come, Holy Spirit, dwell in my soul. I have no good to offer you. I confess my sin, that I am not worthy of your love. Convict me, God, with regards to that sin, with regards to righteousness and judgment. And though I am not worthy, you have shown us and told us that Jesus Christ is worthy. And he is always praying and interceding for his people. So I ask that you would forgive me my sins for his sake. Intercede for me, Lord Jesus. You are my only hope, and I give myself fully to you. Send your spirit on me. Grant me your protection that I might have peace with you, sealing my forgiveness, confirming your grace, and guarding my soul until the day of Jesus' return. We pray in his name. Amen.